Okay, I'll keep letting him in if you'd like to go ahead and start. All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Welcome. This is uh, part two of our What's in Our Air series. In the first part, um, we had data from uh, Dr. Helmink about the monitoring stations and uh, what he's finding with that data. And then we had uh, Andrew from uh, Earthworks uh, give us some FLIR camera um, work that he does. And we also had some photos from Mitzi and some personal accounts. So uh, it was very, very helpful, I think. And that sets the stage for tonight's, which is uh, what's in our air and why should we care? And tonight we're going to talk about some of the health implications. We'll have uh, Dr. Lisa McKenzie talk about her research. And then we'll have um, um, Dr. Uh, Corey <coughs> Carroll, who's with uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility, talk about uh, health impacts uh, as a physician. Uh, we're going to start actually though with Andrew from Earthworks is going to update us on the current drilling up at the night well. And, um, and then uh, just a quick note that our, our part three, uh, which is okay, so now what can we do about this will be September 22nd. We still don't have, um, a, we're, we're hoping we can do that in person. But um, you know we're kind of unsure what's going to happen with this uh, Delta variant, so we'll let you know. We'll be sending that out. Um, but as part of that, what can we do? We're going to have representatives at the city, county, and legislative state legislature uh, talk about what they're working on, and then uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. No. Um, Representative Joe Neguse is going to uh, also talk about what's being done federally. So it should be a really good uh, presentation too. So we're gonna start tonight by um, all of us um, um, uh, introducing ourselves and then uh, Joan is gonna start. So um, I'm Karen Dyke, I am uh, part of the planning committee from, from uh, this Longmont Climate Committee. I also work a lot with uh, Sierra Club and uh, other, um, other environmental groups. Lynette, do you wanna go next? And my name is Lynette McLean and I'm a retired educator and I'm working with this group and with uh, progressive Democrats. So uh, go ahead, uh, Virginia, or no, I mean, uh, Judith. Judith. <laughs> I'm Judith Blackburn, part of the Planning Committee for the Climate Community and several other groups working on environmental issues. And it's a pleasure to see so many people interested in this these days. And Michael? Hi, folks. I'm Michael Belmont. I'm kind of emeritus member of the original uh, fracking band where we uh, did an initiative and, and successfully voted on a fracking ban in Longmont and just participating a bit here in the climate group. Grateful for these presentations. And Missy Nicoletti is in another meeting, but she's on our team also. She's gonna join us a little bit later on. And I should say that uh, I am a retired nurse and I am really overwhelmed with uh, all of the pollution that we have to put up with here in the city. So. Um, um, I find it really abhorrent. So uh, we're going to start with um, Joan Peck is going to give us a little quick, um, she has a few words to say, and uh, she is city council member. Joan. Thank you, Karen. Uh, welcome, everybody. And um, hello, good evening. I uh, am very excited that you're all here to listen in to, to this important subject. This is the second part of a three-part series of the Longmont Climate Community. And I'm really honored that they asked me to give you a quick hello. Um, I am very interested in this subject. Uh, in 2012, I led the petition drive to ban fracking in Longmont and have been continually working towards having a cleaner climate. So uh, I'd like to welcome Drs. Corey Carroll and Lisa McKenzie. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, Lynette, do you want to, you're going to introduce Andrew? Okay, so I would like to introduce Andrew Kluster. He's a certified optical gas imaging thermographer, and that is a mouthful. And he's a Colorado field advocate for earthworks. And he's gonna present some local data he has gathered concerning what is in our air here locally. Um, so go ahead, Andrew. If you wanna say anything else about yourself, go ahead and do that no, too. No, that's a perfect intro. Like I, like I said earlier, if folks really want more of the in-depth bio, they can uh, look, watch the first webinar, catch up. Um, so right. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, cool. Everyone can see that? We're all, everything's working? Perfect. So yes, my name is Andrew Kloster, Colorado Field Advocate with Earthworks, and um, I was asked to give a quick update today um, from my, uh, an update on the presentation I gave on the first webinar in this series. Um, and I'm going to try to be as quick as possible because I want to give plenty of time to our other panelists and this really important discussion tonight. Um, so I'm going to focus in on one site in particular, and I think it's the site that's probably top of mind for most folks in Longmont and surrounding areas, and that is the Cub Creek Night Pad. Um, and I, uh, you know, before I jump right in here where we left off, just in case there's anyone on tonight who um, wasn't on the last webinar, hasn't seen how Earthworks presents our data. So Earthworks, I use an uh, optical gas imaging camera, which is the same camera that um, the industry themselves use regulators at the CDPHE EPA use to detect pollutants at oil and gas sites that are invisible to the naked eye. And that is primarily we're concerned about methane and volatile organic compounds. And I'm sure you're gonna hear quite a bit more about volatile organic compounds during the remainder of this webinar. Um, so on the right-hand side of the slide here, you see an animated GIF, which is pulled directly from a video I took with the OGI camera of the night pad. On the left-hand side, you have digital camera photos taken around the same time from the same angle as this video, um, showing that these pollutants are not pollutants that you can see if you were to just observe the pad with your naked eye. Um, you need a very expensive piece of equipment, unfortunately. Um, so in the, in the GIF, in the animated GIF, you see this plume of pollutants coming off um, the pad from behind the sound wall and drifting across the field there. When I last presented this to you all in May, this was fresh from the field. I had just filed a complaint with CDPHE um, so as this update tonight, I can share that I have subsequently learned that um, on the same day that I filmed this pad on May 13th, um, the CDPHE also had actually VOC monitors set up on a neighboring property and they detected a plume, a, or a plume, a spike of VOCs at about 6 p.m. Um, this video was taken at 7 p.m. They detected as well a couple of spikes after that on this monitor that they had near the site. Um, so armed with both their own monitoring data and with this footage that I had uh, happened to get on the exact same day that they were also monitoring, they approached Cub Creek. And Cub Creek, unfortunately, um, their response to both of these uh, data points um, was that what we're seeing in this video and what they detected in their monitor was just normal drilling operations. Um, I wish I could clarify for you all tonight what exactly that means, but I myself don't know. Um, it could mean a lot of things, honestly. And I think, you know, again, you can see in the footage and from the photos with the sound walls up, it's really hard to tell where these pollutants are coming from. It's hard to know what the source was on the site. Um, I don't think this was the flare on the site. I, I don't believe it was. That has been inspected by the COGCC multiple times. Um, but I also, I just don't know. Um, and it seems as if we never will know because unfortunately, um, Cub Creek has now moved on from, so this was taken during the drilling phase. Most of this year, they've still been drilling these wells. Um, as of just this weekend, they have moved into the completions phase or commonly known, I think, to most people as the actual hydraulic fracturing phase. Um, and that will be continuing for the next uh, two or so months, eight to 10 weeks. And so the second part of this quick update, I just wanna share with you all kind of a public service announcement about the fracking phase and what hopefully may not occur, but to at least potentially expect. Um, fracking historically, traditionally has been one of the more, that phase of the well's life cycle has been one of the more pollution heavy phases. And that's for a variety of reasons, including the fact that you have a lot of increased just vehicle traffic and activity on the site. They also are potentially um, burning their flares or combusting more frequently because 
Um, they're burning off excess methane. And then there's also this really, um, this process called flowback. And flowback is where some of the fluids that they use to actually frack, these fracking fluids that get pumped down into the well to fracture the earth and release the trapped methane, those, a portion of those flow back to the surface during the process. And they're a pretty nasty concoction typically, and they can off-gas some pretty nasty things, including VOCs. Um, so that flowback process has also traditionally been one of the very pollution heavy phases of the well's life cycle. Um, in 2020, the state did adopt new regulations concerning flowbacks specifically. And now flowback fluids need to be stored in closed containers. They need to be flaring off excess gas during this process. And so fingers crossed, um, hopefully this will mean that on these new pads being fracked currently like the night pad, we won't see the same sorts of pollution events that we saw previously on the front range when frack pads were being fracked. Um, but I will be keeping a close eye on this pad during this process, uh, monitoring it as much as I can with the camera. And on the subsequent webinar in September, hopefully I will have um, something to share and let's hope for the best. Um, but in the spirit of hoping for the best and preparing for the worst, I just wanna also one last slide I wanna share with you all. Um, some resources. Um, if you live in and around um, the pad, which is not in the city of Longmont, it's outside of Longmont in Weld County, just north of the Union Reservoir, but it still is near where a lot of people recreate and hang out on the reservoir. If you, for any reason, um, in being in close proximity to the pad, experience anything that you might consider a health impact, um, whether it's dizziness, nausea, uh, headache, something more serious like a nosebleed, please, 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 um, let the CDPHE know. They want to know from residents, they want to know from the public if people are experiencing impacts due to oil and gas development. And so I have on the slide here a couple of con some, a link plus some contact info. I'm also going to put it in the chat after I'm done so people can grab it from there. Um, but that link will take you directly to a web form that you can fill out um, to uh, basically just, it's really quick, does not take too much time, and you just give some info about yourself, the site, and the health impact. There's also a non-health form that you can fill out that's much more concise. And then that phone number and the email are really for directly contacting the CDPHE with this info rather than going through the form. And I will say they tend to be very, very prompt and timely in responding to health concerns. So again, urge you to take advantage of this resource. Um, we all are um, sort of in this, this position right now of, again, kind of watching this and watching and waiting to see if hopefully some of these regulations that have been adopted will make a difference in terms of the emissions that we may see during this phase. Um, so that is all I have. Um, again, wanna, wanna give plenty of time to the, the meat of this conversation, but um, I'll be sticking around through the course of this uh, webinar. And if people have specific questions during q and I'll be here to answer them. Lynette, can I just quick jump in about speaking of questions? Thank you, Andrew. Wow, poignant stuff. Um, speaking of the questions, we're going to take questions at the end, but as you have your questions, type them in while they're on your mind into the chat. We will re note them. Judith and I will uh, track, keep track of them and then ask those questions at the end of the appropriate uh, presenter. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for, for Thank you for saying that, Michael. I appreciate it. Uh, and also I'm gonna try and put the information that Andrew just gave you into the chat too, so that you'll have, you can copy that down if you need to. Okay, next up is Dr. Lisa McKenzie. She is a clinical assistant professor from the Colorado School of Public Health. Uh, and uh, Dr. McKenzie's research has contributed to the understanding of how air pollutants and other exposures resulting from the unconventional development of petroleum resources may affect the public's health. Her studies investigating associations between adverse birth outcomes and childhood cancers and proximity to oil and gas development are among the first epidemiological studies on this topic to appear in the published literature. Her Sentinel Human Health Risk Assessment indicated the potential for respiratory, neurological, and developmental health outcomes resulting from exposure to air pollutants emitted during natural gas development. She has testified before the United States Congress and the Denver Metropolitan Regional Air Quality Council on the public health implications of natural gas development. So thank you so much for being here, Dr. McKenzie, and you may begin. 
Okay, uh, well, good evening. And Lynette, thank you for that introduction and the invitation to present here. I'm just going to get my uh, screen up and uh, hoping that everyone can see that. Uh, now I'm going to try to get over. Okay, so what I'm going to be uh, presenting to you this evening is just talking about some of the health implications and kind of where the uh, current state of the sciences on this. And I'm going to be talking actually a little bit more than just about our studies here in Colorado, but studies that are been done in other states and kind of where um, we're starting to see some agreement in results. So I think that's important. And I'm going to start this with um, what, if you've seen my presentations before, I'm going to start with this kind of bullseye map or a figure, I should say. And if you think of the well site at the center, this is, you know, the source of the air pollutants, um, whether they're coming from the wells or the equipment on the well site. And so that's where you would expect the emissions and the hazards to be highest. And then as you move out from the site, um, the different hazards are changing. And so when you're close to the site, when we think about hazards around a well site, you know, there's things associated with the drill cutting, there's these air emissions, which we've mentioned, which are volatile organic compounds. Um, noise is a big complaint around these, which can also impact people's health. Um, we have nitrogen oxides and the VOCs can uh, work together in the presence of sunshine to form this ground level ozone, which is more of a regional component. Not, it also affects people close, but it's also affecting people further away from the site. I think Detlop is probably talk to you quite a bit about that. Um, we have silica, we have particulate matter. So we have all these hazards. And what I wanna do today is I wanna put these hazards, um, take it from hazards and look at health outcomes. And so I'm going to reference back to this type of figure and just uh, reminding red is closest. And as we get out to green, this is what I would consider uh, people that are fairly far from the site and oftentimes are reference or comparison groups. Uh, before I get to the health effects, I just want to uh, reiterate that uh, since our 2012 risk assessment was published, um, when it was still being debated whether or not oil and gas well sites were sources of volatile organic compounds, including uh, benzene and alkanes, which can impact people's health, this is well established now. I don't think this is argued anymore. This is a source of benzene. Um, it's not the only source out there of benzene, but it is the source of benzene. and um, Benzene, which is a hazardous air pollutant that has been associated with cancers and other um, blood diseases, has been detected uh, in areas of oil and gas development at levels exceeding minimal risk levels for both chronic and acute health effects. Um, we also know from more recent studies that our group has done that particulate matter concentrations, and we're assuming these are mainly from the equipment in vehicles, uh, as far as a thousand feet from the site um, are increasing during the well development activities. So that's drilling, hydraulic fracturing, flow back, those activities. Um, and that noise measurements out to a thousand feet are at levels that can affect sleep and affect cardiovascular health. Uh, so these are all based on measurements that have been taken around oil and gas sites. We also have two fairly recent human health risk assessments that have been done here in Colorado. Uh, these health risk assessments inform some of the new setback rules at the COGCC, particularly the one done by the Holder Group. Um, our risk assessment that our group did, we used actually measurements from samples collected at various distances from oil and gas sites. And we uh, used quite a bit of uh, debt love helmets uh, data too for this. And what we concluded in that study was at about 2,000 feet, we started seeing increases for risk for acute health effects. And at 500 feet, we started to see really steep rises in uh, risk for um, lifetime cancer risks. The study that was done by the Colorado Department of Public Health was actually uh, commissioned by the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. That study actually used modeling from some emission um, uh, ratios that were determined by Jeff Collette up at Colorado State University. And they also found they started to see increases in cancer risk around 2,000 feet. They didn't look at 500 feet, so they didn't, we couldn't compare that. They also saw 
increases in acute health risk starting around 2000 feet. So I just wanted to go over those studies. But what I mainly wanna to do today is, is talk about the epidemiological studies. And before we get into that, let's just do a quick review of epidemiology a little bit, because I know this isn't really a familiar science to a lot of people. Um, so we can start out with these predictive types of studies, which I just discussed, the risk, this risk assessment, things like the health impact assessment that was done in Battlement Mesa in 2010. And those help us generate some hypotheses of what some health effects around oil and gas development might be. But they don't tell us if there's a cause and effect. The next thing we can go on to in our um, tier of studies are these case series studies where we start looking at health effects in people around the site. So what they're reporting to physicians and things like that and start to see if we can develop um, symptoms that are common among people. And we have the ecological studies where we can compare counties, you know, counties with development to counties without development, zip codes with development to zip codes without development. And these also are good for generating hypotheses of what's going on. And then the next thing we wanna to go to are these analytic studies. And these are the studies where we can start thinking about cause and effect or um, establish what we call temporality, that an exposure might've occurred before the health effect occurred. And these are the case control studies, and I'll be talking about a few of these in cohort studies. And then, so we're actually following popula populations, either going back in time and using data and following them or following them forward in time. Most of the studies around oil and gas have been uh, what we call retrospective looking back in time. And to date, there have been about uh, 53 epidemiological studies uh, published now. So this is, a, it, it goes up every year. Um, there's just more and more. And um, most of these studies, what they're doing for their exposure to oil and gas is some sort of proximity measurement. So they're either looking at the distance of all the wells within a certain uh, buffer around a home um, and counting all those wells, or they're looking at the density, um, giving more weight to wells that might be closer to the homes. Some of them have been looking specifically at different phases of development to look at differences in that. And our more recent studies, we've started looking at this measure we call intensity of oil and gas activities. So we look at the distance of wells from home, give more weight to the wells that are closer, and also take a, into account the activities that are occurring on the well pad to um, estimate an intensity of air pollution emissions. So um, with that, I'm gonna start with the studies that have been done on early life. Um, what we're finding, um, what, what you'll see from this is early life is a particularly vulnerable time for these exposures. And that's where most of the epidemiological studies have focused to date. So two studies now have looked at fetal deaths and oil and gas development. And they looked at a range of dates between 2003 and 2012. And these studies were done, uh, one was done in Pennsylvania and the other one was done in Texas. And the Pennsylvania study was one of those ecological studies. So it's kind of a hypothesis generating study. And what they found was that there was a significant increase in infant mortality in 10 counties with hydraulic fracturing present. And over the same time period in the state of Pennsylvania, infant mortality had decreased. And they were actually not attributing that to air, they were attributing that to groundwater contamination. In a later study, or in the same year um, in Texas, there was a study, and this was a case control study, where they um, looked at fetal deaths. And what they found was fetal deaths were much more likely, 29 to 30% more likely, in areas with the highest levels of oil and gas development. So once again, that's comparing to this reference with little or no development. And as you're getting closer to the sites, you're seeing this increase in um, fetal deaths. Okay, and then we have, sorry, I'm having trouble with the slide here. Okay, the next we have uh, four studies that evaluated specific birth defects or congenital defects. And 
Two of these were studies we did here in Colorado, and then there's a very recent study that was published in tech, um, the Eagle Ford in Texas, and another one in Oklahoma. And of those uh, four studies, what we're seeing is that both congenital heart defects and neural tube defects are much more likely if the mother is living in areas of dense oil and gas development. And it's a twofold increase or 100% increase as you're getting into these high density areas. And for the congenital to heart defects, we're actually seeing this dose response. So as we're getting more oil and gas development, the likelihood of congenital to heart, very specific congenital to heart defects is increasing. Uh, neural tube defects, we didn't see the uh, dose response. Uh, we basically just saw the jump in the higher areas of oil and gas development. Neural tube defects include things like spina bifida and, uh, and so that could be, and I can't say that very well. I think uh, probably Dr. Carroll could correct me on that pronunciation. And then we have um, over 10 studies that have looked at preterm births. And preterm births are defined as births that occur before 37 weeks of gestation or pregnancy. So they're a little, they occur early. And these studies have been done in several states. They've been done in uh, California, Texas. We've done it in Colorado, Pennsylvania, and British Columbia. And our, um, in our first study on this in Colorado, we actually didn't see an association between preterm births and proximity to oil and gas development, but there were some limitations in that study that we think may have obscured our results. It was an early study and we think the exposure measures have improved since then. Um, since then, most of the studies are starting to see an association between preterm births and oil and gas development, although it is a little mixed. So basically what they're seeing in, in the higher density areas is anywhere from zero, which is nothing, none like we observed to 40% increases in preterm births. Um, the studies differ somewhat in their methodology, so I think there's more work to be here done here, but more recent studies are starting to um, kind of coalesce around this association with preterm births too. The studies have also been looking at birth weights, which is another uh, indicator of infant health. And what they're, um, the studies have been pretty mixed on birth weights. Some of them are seeing associations with birth weights, uh, decreased birth weights in proximity to oil and gas development or density of oil and gas development, and others are not. And the ones that are seeing an association, it's, it's not a large, uh, like when they actually look at actual birth weights, the decrease in birth weight is on the order of, you know, um, five to 10 grams. It's not a real large decrease. So, for now, um, my conclusion would be this is kind of inconclusive right now on the birth weights. I think there's more work to be done. I'd like to be more um, sure of this particular outcome. Now, also, um, so that that's that's looking at early life and um, you kind of pointing out there are several indicators here now that um, children, particularly the fetus and infants are um, potentially negatively being impacted by this. Um, there have now been um, eight studies on uh, lower respiratory effects, including asthma and pneumonia. And these studies have been done in California, Pennsylvania, and Texas. We don't have any here in Colorado right now. And what, we what they've been finding is uh, for asthma, that they're seeing really pretty dramatic increases in asthma. And what they've looked at for asthma are um, pediatric hospitalizations for asthma and exacerbations of asthma. Um, and they've particularly seen more exacerbations for people with mild asthma. Um, and I just wanna point out, I mean, these are pretty dramatic, up to fourfold increases is you get into high, the highest density of oil and gas development. Interestingly, um, also in addition to um, kind of the general population in children, um, the one study in uh, Texas has observed a five to eight percent increase in hospitalizations in 
elderly people for pneumonia. And so this may be also impacting another vulnerable population, which is our elderly population. And most recently in LA, um, a study done by Jill Johnson's group is they're actually looked at people in Los Angeles that were living near active oil wells. And those people were reporting, self-reporting higher uh, incidence of wheeze, sore throats, uh, chest tight, tightness and eye and nose irritation, dizziness and ringing of the ears is at about 650 feet from the well sites and then compared to people further away. And then Dr. Johnson went in and actually measured two measures of lung function in these people. She measured the volume of air they can expire from their lungs and she measured the um, total lung capacity. And both of those measures were decreased in the people living closer to the wells, closer than 650 feet than people living further away. Okay, we have three studies that have looked at cancer. Um, the first two studies that looked at cancer were done in Pennsylvania and they were both ecological studies. So comparing um, zip codes or excuse me, they were comparing counties pretty much. And they saw some indications of increases in potential increases in bladder cancer and possibly central nervous system cancers. But in Colorado, we were actually able to do a case control study, which is uh, more analytic. And what we observed there is that childhood leukemias were increasing with increasing proximity to oil and gas development. So what we're seeing here is also this dose response. That is, we're get, is you're getting into more dense areas of oil and gas development, the uh, likelihood of the childhood leukemias was going up, almost a, a greater than a fourfold increase in our densest areas. And then finally, the last one I'm going to show you here with this kind of uh, diagram is the cardiovascular effects. And now we have three studies that have actually looked at uh, cardiovascular effects. And the first one was done here in Colorado. We did it here in, on the denver Julesburg Basin um, with in 97 volunteers in um, basically in Greeley and in Fort Collins and a few in Windsor. And what we found in that study is um, indicators of cardiovascular disease increased as you had greater intensity of oil and gas development around you. And while um, these might not have um, a great significant clinical uh, impact, it is an increase in systolic blood pressure as you're getting closer to the well sites. And we also say, saw similar increases in a measure of arterial stiffness. In a study uh, in Pennsylvania, they observed that hospitalizations for people that had heart failure increased by up to 70% as they got into the, as they were living in the areas with denser oil and gas development. And this was in elderly patients. So this is again, looking at that elderly population. And a similar study also observed increases in hospital, uh, hospitalizations with myocardial infarctions. So there have been other studies that have uh, looked at some other health uh, outcomes, we don't have quite as many. These are kind of one study here and there. Um, there was a study in Pennsylvania that um, saw significant increases in nasal and sinus infections, migraine headaches, and fatigue syndromes around oil and gas development. Um, we're starting to, there's starting to be studies on uh, mental health, uh, so seeing increases in potentially depression and sleep disorders. Um, and then um, there have been a couple studies looking at hospitalizations at the zip code level, and they've uh, observed uh, some increases in cardiology and neurology and uh, geno-urinary conditions uh, in the areas of oil and gas development. So that's kind of where the epidemiological uh, studies are starting to agree with each other. and. Um, I, I should also say, they've also looked at some things that they have not found associations. And I think that's important to point out here. 
Um, the studies, there have been a couple studies now that looked at oral clefts, our study and uh, the study in Texas, Eagle Ford, didn't find any associations with uh, birth defects involving an oral cleft. When they've combined birth defects, have not looked at specific ones. They have not seen um, effects. Same thing when they combine different types of cancer. This is because when you define, uh, when you combine outcomes, you can dilute your effect. You might not be able to see it anymore. Um, we look at non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in children, did not see an effect. And um, the ecological study also didn't observe, uh, seen an indicator for thyroid cancer. So this is another uh, paper that I think is important for you to consider. This was published by uh, the Environmental Protection Agency in 2018. And what they're predicting is by uh, 2025, that there'll be 960 and 1,000 premature deaths per year from the ozone and particulate matter attributed upstream oil and gas. And that the highest rates will be um, in the, on the front range of Colorado. Um, so that, that's quite a sobering statistic, I believe. And I will just conclude by kind of just once again, emphasizing that many of these health effects, um, what the studies are seeing is um, fetal deaths, birth defects, childhood leukemias, preterm births. So these are all impact impacts in early life. We're also th seeing things that are impacting our elderly populations, pneumonia, um, and then our general population, decreased lung function, these cardiovascular effects, and asthma, and this, this is the premature death from the FAN study. So I think this is quite a few in what we've looked at so far. Um, you can probably see that the studies haven't looked at everything. And one thing that we still haven't been able to do um, that we'd like to do at some point is actually do a study where we can measure components in air and associate those and measure health effects in people. So do that concurrently. So we can actually get um, some stronger evidence on temporality and cause and effect. And I will, I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McKenzie. This is um, always, always interesting and uh, I thank you for your presentation and also for your commitment to this work. I think it's so important that we uh, begin to have um, have this level of study. Uh, you know, a lot of things have to prove that they're safe before they can be in our neighborhoods. And this is turned around. We have to prove that it's not safe in order to get it out of our neighborhoods and away from uh, from people. So uh, it's a little bit upside down. It's uh, sort of a precautionary principle. I think that's what that's called. So thank you so much. Dr. Thank Carol, you. if you want to start your screen sharing, I'll begin introducing you. Our next, um, our next speaker is um, Dr. Corey Carroll. He's a board certified family physician. He's currently in solar practice in Fort Collins. Uh, Dr. Carroll completed his the residency in 1992 in Fort Collins Family Medicine after um, matriculating from the University of Cincinnati School of Medicine. His undergraduate degree was in mechanical engineering from Colorado State University. And then he went into the US Air Force upon graduating, got a master's from the Air Force Institute of Technology, was on active duty in the Air Force, and then uh, worked with a um, group of scientists to decrease injury to pilots ejecting from high-speed aircraft. And he did that for six years before he went into medical school. His passion for our environment stems from the knowledge that health requires clean air, water, and food. Preventing disease is much smarter than treating it and has been the focus for the last few decades of medical practice. In 2007, he worked to have the Colorado Medical Society adopt a policy opposing the practice of in, in situ and open pit mining, uh, much to the chagrin of Colorado Mining and Oil and Gas Association. He's on the board of directors for Physicians for, so I can't talk tonight, Physicians for Social Responsibility, known as PSR, uh, Colorado and Northern uh, Colorado Medical Society, 
Poudre Canyon group of the Sierra Club. And I know, I know uh, Corey through that uh, venue. Uh, Corey enjoys the mountains, riding his road bike, making music with his friends and twice daily walks with his dog that allow him to uh, hit much needed decompression from medical practice and volunteer work. And we all need to remember to take care of ourselves as we're doing that. So Dr. Carroll, well, thanks. Hopefully my talk will be not that much longer than what you just introduced. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the oil and gas that I did earlier was the, against uranium. And um, it, was a, it was a mistake. I think Dr. McKenzie has pointed out this is a zoning issue. We can't have these dangerous um, uh, industrial activities near people. So I'm assuming everybody can hear me OK. I'm not hearing any feedback of no, so I'll keep going. All right, so uh, I think everybody's well aware of this uh, unconventional process that, um, uh, that I'm sure others have talked about and have much better um, activities. What I'm gonna focus on is uh, not the technology of pulling this stuff out of the ground and the, and the quite amazing um, work that's being done, but uh, the harms that are going on. and um, um, sometimes the industry says, don't worry, it's fine. And the, uh, the truth is they're lying. So, um, you know, skin and respiratory conditions uh, are just the beginning of this process. I really appreciate Dr. McKenzie's work because she gives us in a medical view, um, you know, the strong data. A lot of times we're making observations. Uh, we call it the... Um, the practice of medicine, because sometimes we're um, not exactly sure what's happening. And uh, I'll, I'll get to a little bit of that where I don't think doctors are really taken into, into a fact the environment, but fracking is definitely a, a problematic situation for the entire human system. Uh, not only the brain nervous system, obviously we heard about Dr. McKenzie's work and other works with uh, asthma, um, we're looking at irritation of the skin, eyes, ears, and nose. Uh, Andrew was talking about reporting if you have symptoms, critically important to do. Um, and the heart and blood vessels, the increased uh, number of people going to the hospital with heart attacks and congestive heart failure, even the digestive system. A major concern to me is obviously in the reproductive system and uh, what's happening to the fetus as it is uh, in, in very critical stages, certainly in the first trimester, what's happening, and endocrine, uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals. So let's um, let's go. What happened to my slides? I am not. There we go. So um, fracking is pulling out methane and other activities, and um, we've learned about uh, the, the videography that Andrew's doing through Earthworks, and we can see what's happening when they're burning it. Um, the, the, the diagram that shows all the yellow and red dots, I think that's Boston, and that's methane leaking out of the inter intercity pipe system. Um, Andrew actually has done some work. You see the storage tank down at the bottom left. I have a patient not too far away from there that uh, Andrew's gone out and captured uh, uh, emissions that are causing headaches and, and issues. Um, so the, the bottom line is when you look at this, we're dealing with chemicals and, and small chain chemicals, as we see at the top of the right uh, uh, cartoon there, are those your, your domestic gas, petroleum, um, as you increase the carbons and you, and you are um, refining this, you're creating the gasoline, the kerosene, the diesel lubricants. Those aren't um, uh, that good for us either, but basically we're gonna be focusing on the, um, the small uh, uh, carbon molecules. Uh, just to throw this in, um, we certainly have a, a concern with our, and PSR Colorado with healthy electric homes because when you're in a home that's being, uh, that's using um, uh, quote, natural gas methane for heating of your water heater, your furnace, and your cooking, you are creating a lot of these chemicals which are problematic. And we found um, studies showing increased asthma and, and especially kids that have um, uh, um, a pre-existing condition. So why are these chemicals harmful to our health? I already mentioned some of these. 
Um, I'm going to take you on a distended. No, I'm not going to go into the organic chemistry, but I am going to kind of be in a nerd and a doctor. I'm going to talk about um, kind of why this is critically important and also very hard to sort out. Um, as I look at the human body, I'm just amazed at how it works. And it has a lot of things that uh, are necessary for a healthy life, a lot of things that have to be done right, such as exercise. Uh, when you're adding contaminated ingredients, if you think of this as a cooking demonstration, something that's, that's bad or it's going to, it's, it's old or expired and of so, uh, spoiled is going to have an adverse effect on the outcome, which is uh, the meal you're going to eat. Um, our bodies, our cells, our microscopic cooking factories that not only need the right ingredients, but we need to mitigate the, um, the bad ingredients. So carbohydrates, fat, protein, these are the macronutrients, as you can see, there's carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, a little bit of nitrogen thrown in with the protein molecule, these are the concerns um, that come, are mainly coming out of the ground when they're pumping out, especially with the uh, fracking. Uh, methane is what we want to capture, uh, but you'll get propane, cyclohexane, ethanol, and then you look at the benzene and the toluene and naphthene. And we know that the, um, the uh, components of the bottom uh, do are carcinogenic. Um, there's still uh, kind of unknowns about some of the chemicals at the top. So the cartoon of the cell is that you've got this amazing thing with the nucleus and the endoplasmic reticulum and the both, all these things we were taught in physiology, but we have to understand these are chemical factories that are working. And as, as our bodies grew from that single cell and, and the uh, mother fertilized by the, the DNA from the father, we have, um, these stem cells that, that begin to uh, 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 become their final uh, uh, cell line, such as neurologic system, heart, lung, kidney, skeletal. And again, each one of those cells has those um, material, the uh, organelles inside, and they're all cranking out whatever they're supposed to be doing, whether it's um, making the serotonin in the, in the uh, neurologic system, whether it's uh, contracting, such as in the heart, they have to basically be healthy. And the question is going to be, and, and this is where Dr. McKinsey's work is critically important, what do we know about you know, chronic low exposure? Uh, we need to know more. We obviously know when you're hit with a large uh, amount of any of these diseases, it's, it's ter terrible, but the problem is, as these wells are producing and the proximities, et cetera. But I kind of look at the volatile organic compounds as being things that can affect people much farther away. Um, how much? We do know that ozone, that's a regional issue and that's definitely related to that, the oil and gas. So again, um, the uh, leukemia we have data on, but we also know that the uh, Endocrine disruption that occurs can affect the adrenal gland, the testes, ovaries, uh, the, um, the endocrine function of the pancreas, such as insulin and um, other thyro thyroid disease, which is uh, involved with uh, your metabolism. Also, the parathyroid hormones are involved with bone metabolism um, up in the brain, the hypothalamus, et cetera. So these are all going to have... Uh, problems that there's uh, these uh, organic uh, volatile organic contents introduced typically through the respiratory system but it can come through the dermal system uh, if you have skin exposure and we you know we shouldn't forget about the water contamination and as I mentioned the uh, gestational period and in the newborn those are uh, the most susceptible times of human beings and um, we do know that uh, uh, everybody knows this is something we need to avoid um, the question is how much uh, are we getting uh, without knowing? Um, the asthma, uh, we talked about the combination of sunshine with VOCs and uh, NOxes. Um, I have patients that I'm, that one gentleman actually moved from Fort Collins because he, every time he traveled back to Wisconsin, he didn't need his rescue inhalers and he was breathing well. 
the question is how many uh, visits to the emergency room and probably more importantly, how many doctors recognize that the ozone and the VOCs um, could be contributing to the exacerbation of asthma in their patient, the exacerbation of heart disease in their patient. Um, again, sorry to be a little redundant, but we have to be worried about not only the vulnerable community members, we talked about the people that live near oil and gas, it's not rich people in big, beautiful homes, it's folks that can't afford to live elsewhere. And they definitely um, take the brunt of the, of the industry. We also have to worry about the uh, workers there and um, you know what's happening to them in the, uh, in the long term and the short term. Many of them are unaware of the uh, concerns. Um, from a health perspective, I kind of worry a lot about the bigger picture. I think um, we have to understand with climate change, that's that, as we all know, we're looking at heat stroke, we're looking at um, the, uh, the potential changes in our um, virons that are, that are passed on by mosquitoes and other um, arthropod uh, uh, vectors that basically will change as our climate changes. Um, we also, to me, and we know this from the Colorado River, uh, the stress that's going to occur as we're uh, moving further and further away from snowpack and available fresh water to drink, it's, um, it's not a pretty picture. I mean, not only for the, the farmers that are trying to grow the uh, almonds in California, but the people trying to live on this planet when um, they don't have many resources and water is, is taken away. Um, so in the bigger picture from health, uh, we talk about um, you know heat stress, asthma, allergies. We got to talk about the cardiovascular. I talked a little bit about the uh, like the Zika and the West Nile and even malaria uh, are going to be concerns if our temperatures change and those uh, vectors, uh, vector boring organisms move into our location. And uh, Dr. McKenzie mentioned the the mental health issues that go along with the. Uh, uh, concerns and the noise and uh, what's going to happen. So I think it's important to maintain um, understanding. I, I try to be very clear to, to uh, folks saying, I don't want to put people out of business, but I don't want people in business that are killing us and our children and ruining our future. Now, I'm going to go a little further. Um, and kind of talk a little bit about uh, maybe some of the, the problems. Um, we need to know in medicine um, a better idea of what's happening. And thanks to Dr. McKenzie and other, we're getting there. There are some different, organ different organizations that have these uh, uh, services out. Uh, Southwest Pennsylvania has a, a toolkit out. This is a group in Alberta and Canada. And again, I think as clinicians, we need to think, uh, is that child coming in with asthma related to the bad ozone days? By the way, I think one, July 20 out of the, the 29, 30 days were um, ozone um, uh, uh, concerns. And uh, I've never seen that before, that many bad ozone days. But clinicians, I think, are sometimes oblivious to the facts. Uh, and this is the, uh, an article published in, in 2016 that is kind of uh, showing that the medical system is not really paying attention. Dr. McKenzie's out doing her work, John Adgate and others, but the, the typical practitioner is really somewhat oblivious uh, to not only these, uh, these uh, carcinogens and volatile organic compounds and the ozones, but a lot of the other issues like the heat stroke and other things that are related to this, uh, this industry. Um, Again, you know, the, the uh, bloody nose and the skin irritation, uh, I don't like, but what I really am concerned about is as that per persists, you see um, changes that can occur to the, to the tissue and you get the uh, uh, exacerbation of asthma, even the, I think the creation of asthma, although that's not proven, but then you start getting into the economic dilemmas of doctor visits, school absences, work absences, you can't work and then finally um, people that die. We do know that um, in, in coronavirus, uh, for example, um, exposure to particulate matter, matter uh, worsens outcomes. And uh, that's also, you know, we know particulate matter comes from various, various places, but uh, to me, let's clean up where we can and keep moving on. 
Um, so the top 13 reasons, a lot of these, as I have highlighted in yellow, are uh, potentially related to exposures. And I, th I think doctors need to pay more attention. Um, when I went to the county commissioner's meeting about uh, um, setbacks uh, and the rules here in Larimer County, um, Dr. McKenzie has articles in this uh, compendium, but it's a fabulous, uh, uh, this is the sixth edition. I, I printed out the seventh edition for them and it just goes on and on and on and, and more and more data is coming that is telling us that this is something that we need to uh, move away from for our health and for our future. Um, I'm gonna play a little game here and that's just gonna say, why, why do we drag our feet? Um, tobacco, um, we used to say it was cool. We used to say, who, what doctors do you smoke? Lucky strikes or camels? Um, it's fascinating. Uh, um, Edward Bernays is a, I won't go into that, but, but using uh, subconscious to help um, sell products is, is something that the industry does. And also denial is another thing they use to kind of keep us moving away. Uh, but the reason I bring this up is that um, similar to what I think is happening in our oil and gas industry where there's a known uh, concern, we have all these reports. In 1964, Dr. Uh, Luther Terry uh, said, you know, I think we have enough data. Um, he's holding up the, uh, the book as I'm holding up the compendium. But he said, I think we should do something about this thing called smoking and, um, and disease in, in, our, um, in our citizens as they do these things. Cause of lung cancer and laryngeal cancer, probable cause of lung cancer, and then the most important cause of chronic bronchitis. And um, what, what he was hit with was, was a unified effort from the tobacco industry to um, draw uh, 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 con confounding statements and uh, uh, um, moving away from the, from the discussion and saying, you know, we're just, whoops, in the right direction here. We are not sure that really these these uh, this thing called cigarettes are that bad for you, and um, maybe we should uh, not in, you know put any uh, warnings on the cigarettes, and maybe we shouldn't do some of the things. Denying the harms of this product, is spreading the scientific evidence that showed these harms, funding research that was intended to divert attention, kind of what we see today. I know Dr. McKenzie's had um, her um, work. Uh, criticized. And again, this is a, a classic, uh, 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 what's the right word, uh, plan to uh, move away from that. So the playbook, which I'm looking at. So it's not, to me, uh, uh, surprising that the industry is trying to discredit folks like Dr. McKenzie and, and all these things. And there's just uh, a lot of effort that's being put in because this industry really doesn't want to change its way. So I think the same thing um, with our uh, battle against tobacco, which by the way, doctors took about 20 years from that to really get on board, but I don't think we have the time to do that now. So um, I think that's just important to understand that with, um, with fracking, we're seeing the same tactics, the same playbook, and what we need to do, what the doctors need to do, what the researchers need to do is just continue to stay um, focused in the science and the evidence. Um, I'm hoping more of my colleagues will um, take into account the possibility of these um, pollutants causing the diseases that we see on a day-to-day -day basis and be, um, and be uh, uh, workers in the uh, uh, process of trying to make rules to create a safer and safer and help us move away from um, our, our dependence on fossil fuel. Um, some other folks from PSR were on a conference call with Senator Bennett and Senator Hickenlooper to try to continue to ask them to, um, to push forward with the efforts to move us in that direct direction as a nation. Uh, but however we can help um, the local folks and the, the, even my colleagues understand the science would be something I would love to, to do. But to me, the evidence is overwhelming and we should not drag our feet on this. 
And for the sake of our patients, our children, our future, uh, we need to we need to get more aggressive in uh, in uh, fighting this industry. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. And uh, I also wanted to say I hear that uh, Larimer County passed some pretty good um, regulations um, for oil and gas. Some increased setbacks and such. Um, 2,000 2, foot is what the county commissioners held to. The, uh, uh, the planning uh, folks that were working there were much less, they, they were okay with 500 feet in some locations. Um, so we have a hard setback of 2,000 square feet. Obviously there are some rooms there. A big disappointment was monitoring. I, I, uh, I wanna have, uh, uh, continuous monitoring uh, in as many places as possible. Um, and I guess our next step will be to go to our city to uh, try to implement that. And I know, Karen, one of your passions is water, uh, not only you know the, the potability of water and drinking water, but the insanity of taking potable water and um, shoving it down a well site and forever um, destroying it. So um, many, many reasons to move on this, uh, on this topic. No, you know, I won't uh, probably be happy until we ban it, but um, that's just me. Uh, hopefully someday, right? Um, I would like to invite you to type in any questions into the chat and um, uh, we'll have uh, Michael and Judith will be uh, sorting through any questions and then we'll have our um, our, our speakers and Dr. Helmig is also on the call. Uh, he might be able to answer questions also. I want to start, though, with having Mitzi introduce herself. She's here from our meeting. She's part of our committee. Mitzi, can you unmute yourself? And No, you can't because you aren't a, um, <laughs> you aren't a co-host. And um, um, I don't know how to do that. And Lynette had to step off. So um, uh, we'll just go ahead with um, uh, questions. Okay, uh, this is Judith. Um, I have a question and I do want to encourage the people listening to this to write their questions into the chat so we can pass them along. But this is a question for Dr. Carroll. Um, my understanding is that it's difficult for parents to get information about how, how many VOCs or other uh, indicators that their their children have been uh, exposed to a great deal of pollution that doctors don't have adequate ways of testing that that's affordable or covered by insurance. And one parent told me that her doctor recommended a panel is what she called it. And I don't understand what that is, but that it cost um, several hundred dollars to get this her child tested for um, how much exposure had stuck with her body. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Can you talk a little bit about what kind of um, measurements doctors can use to advise parents to make their complaints? Sure. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this is a, a realm of unknown. Uh, the uh, the actual measurement of uh, volatile organic compounds can occur. Um, I'll, uh, and again, I'm not the expert in this, but I, I, at the 2019 uh, oil and gas, unconventional harm effect, uh, health effects of oil and gas that PCR put in, in the fe February of 19, Dr. Uh, and I'm going to butcher her last name, but she was, uh, she was a, um, a mom and a clinical, not a pharma, pharmacologist, but she was uh, very concerned of living uh, near oil and gas, uh, something she was uh, not anticipating. At that time, she was able to use one of the um, outside laboratories, not in the traditional system, but I think it was Genova, and, and put a panel and was very concerned with the results. Uh, when she brought this up to the uh, CDPHE, the Colorado Department of Health and uh, Education, or health and environment, um, they said that those testings are invalid. The only quote unquote testing that is valid would be done through um, the CDC 
and you would require official um, approval. Now, in hearing that as a physician, it kind of blew me away thinking, well, why can't we um, get some of these tests online? Why can't we move in that direction? And we don't have, I think, the data to really um, do the test accurately. You have to understand even the, the rubber stopper on top of the vial collecting the blood could em eliminate, uh, emanate VOCs and contaminate the sample. So there's all sorts of, of uh, difficult issues that we just can't have every lab in the, in the country running these tests. That's number one. Number two is what does it mean? Because um, we really can't say, uh, you know, I don't think all of us say it's probably not a good thing, but then to say, well, this is the level that's going to create this and this is going to do that. Um, hopefully, um, we may move in that direction. Um, I mean, think about lung cancer and cigarette smoking. Um, when do we know when people have disease? It's, it's really hard to measure that quantitative of when are you going to move from normal lung, you know, healthy normal lung to COPD, emphysema, when are you going to get the cancer? Um, that's very difficult to measure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to uh, interrupt you, Judith, and Mitzi's unmuted now and she can introduce herself. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. Thanks, Karen. My name is Mitzi Nicoletti, and I'm also part of this group that put on the webinar. And I'm at Union Reservoir on a regular basis because I'm a competitive rower. And I do visit with my fellow rowers on a regular basis. On Tuesday, July 20th, I was out there with some other rowers and one person left early because they felt lightheaded, but we went ahead and went out halfway around. I started feeling lightheaded, then nauseous and um, finally got in and did not feel good at all. And I had a friend with me and I said, you know, I think I got to go home. And I uh, canceled the morning, got in my house, made it upstairs and started throwing up. So I felt like my body was really trying to throw something off. And I got sick all day, canceled all my clients. My friend that left early, I spoke to him on Friday and he actually went home. And he, has, he felt like his stomach was real upset and ended up He's a software engineer laying on the couch for a few hours. What I have also noticed um, is I've had a lot of sinus headaches. So unfortunately, I canceled my work. And um, this week, I've been just working out with a mask on. I, I bought a different mask so that I can breathe while I work out. I did notice on Tuesday, black smoke was coming out of the night well. And so basically, you know, we keep an eye on it. We don't know what we're doing to ourselves. We, you know, if you're an athletic person and you enjoy the outdoors and also uh, want to protect the environment, not only the air, but the water, it, it is kind of hard staying inside all the time. But those are just some of my personal experiences um, that, of course, I've been very concerned about and just wanted to share that from someone that has had these things happen. Thank you. Thanks, Mitzi. Okay, Judith, take it over again. Okay, well, um, my, another question I have is for um, Dr. McKenzie. Um, I'd like to know a little more about who pays for these studies and whether the um, funders of <coughs> studies um, respond to the outcome or expect a certain kind of outcome or how, how the sponsorship affects the design and results of a study or whether it does. <laughs> okay, so... Um most of the studies that have been done um, have been, what happens is an investigator puts in a proposal to um, either a, um, the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, or um, sometimes the Environmental Protection Agency, some of these studies. 
or some sort of foundation like the American Heart Association has funded some of my work and the American Cancer Society. So we put in a proposal saying this is what we would like to do. And that goes through a very rigorous review process. And um, sometimes you submit several times. Sometimes we've submitted proposals that have never been funded, um, and so, as have other investigators, and, and sometimes they're funded. The funding organization then has um, really no more involvement in what the outcomes of the study are, or they don't, they don't control what you publish, they don't review what you publish or anything like that. So they, they provide funding based on what you say you're going to do in your proposal and based on what a panel of reviewers thinks if, if they believe you can do it and if it, they feel that it is scientifically valid. And so that's, that's the way it, it works with most of these studies. I will say the first study we did um, back in Battlement Mesa was funded by the Garfield County Commissioners. And that, um, although we, we, we went on to publish the results as we saw them, um, they, they did have, um, they had a lot to say about the results. Yeah. What, what kinds of things did they have to say? <laughs> uh, well, um, so the, the way I just, we also had citizen groups we were working with too. So um, the way I describe that study is no one was happy with us. The commissioners weren't happy with us. The citizens groups weren't happy with us because we didn't say, we didn't say they should just ban fracking and stop the project, which was what the citizens wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. And we didn't say that it was perfectly okay and no health effects, which, which was what the, I believe the industry wanted to hear and what possibly some of the commissioners wanted to hear. So we didn't say either one of those things. And so everyone <laughs> was a little unhappy with us. Oh, sorry to hear that. Uh -huh. There is a question from Karen here uh, and probably uh, Dr. McKenzie, for you, uh, is it possible that different health effects are seen at different sites because the pollutants vary among well sites? It's definitely possible that some of the air pollutants might differ between air so uh, sites and the concentration of pollutants might differ between sites. Right. So, uh, and as we know, different different operators are doing things differently. And so a lot of the levels of pollutants are gonna depend on the, how many controls and how well they've implemented the emission controls at their site, right? Um, they also use varying mixtures of um, fracking fluids and drilling muds. Um, the sites differ, uh, the emissions may differ depending on the type of petroleum resource they're going into, wet gas, dry gas, um, oil, um, usually most of the sites like the DJ are some sort of mixture of oil and gas. Um, over in Garfield County, they're a little higher on the gas side of things. Um, so yeah, all those things can impact things. So they can vary state to state too. I mean, mm -hmm. California has a lot of oil wells historically, for example. Mm -hmm. And I had one quick one question uh, that I wrote down, and then if I don't see any further questions, maybe we should wrap up shortly. But uh, also, I think for you, Dr. McKenzie, the information you presented for me, and uh, specifically about stillbirth defects and preterm birth, were just that seems to be unequivocally be unequivocally associated with fracking operations. I mean, that's just particularly egregious and especially for those families. Um, and it seems critical that that information and the results of those studies should be gotten to uh, those that are in positions of power and influence as quickly as possible. Uh, is, so do, do you know of any concerted effort and coordinated effort to get that information out to physicians, medical clinics, and legislators in particular, maybe for local, state, and, and national? Um, I, so, you know, so the, the study in Texas was just published this year, so I, I don't know what they've done with their results, but the um, study we did here, I think that was made available to the COGCC as they were making their rules. Um, I did testify on some of that. Um, I think 
the uh, Dr. Carroll can speak to what PSR is doing. I think they've done quite a bit. Um, there is also, um, well, I get all the names of these um, um, different groups, but um, that there are other activist groups that are bringing these um, studies in front of legislators and um, I have presented results to city councils, to uh, Boulder County um, commissioners um, when asked. So it, it's, uh, you know, the studies, the actual manuscripts are quite technical and um, yeah. <laughs> kind of, you know, uh, can be hard to interpret. So, um, but, but we do, we do try. Um, of course, as researchers, we also wanna make sure that we also have the time to keep doing Sure, our sure. research and writing the proposals and writing up the results. So um, we, we have two ongoing studies. I can, um, we're looking one at uh, atrial fibrillation um, to see if that is uh, worsened during the development of well sites for people living near the sites. And we're doing, we just got funded by the American Cancer Society to do a more robust study on the childhood cancers. Mm -hmm. so, um, I'll weigh in. Michael. Oh, go ahead. I'll write, weigh in real quick. Um, I, I brought up, you know, in my slide presentation uh, uh, with the tobacco, kind of to point out that that issue of like, here's uh, kind of what we all suspected. Here's what the common sense said. But then what happens when you put the data in front of people and start looking at it? And you have to understand, Michael, that the industry is really uh, unwilling uh, to just roll over and say, yeah, you're right, we, we're bad. Um, so they're gonna fight and they're gonna create doubt and other things. Um, that doesn't mean that we can't do a better job. I, I don't understand, and the article in 2016 I showed was the, was the scathing discussion that doctors aren't taught about the environmental uh, impact, especially as our world is moving more towards uh, these uh, potential exposures and that. Um, but it does, I think that's our job here tonight is to continue to move forward, try to get folks involved with that. Uh, Mitzi, I just wanted to say to you, um, you know, Andrew, I'm not sure if you were on the site, but to everybody and to pass this along, if, if you suspect there's an exposure and you're having symptoms, you know, and yours, I would absolutely say it was related uh, to very likely um, volatile organic compounds, um, make a report. And, and do everything you can. And I think if the CDPHE has more and more and more people complaining and more and more uh, issues, that'll get their attention. When the politicians see more and more people demanding things change, when the people come to them saying, um, I wanna protect my, my daughter-in-law and I wanna protect my family, um, we need to move forward. When I went to the county commissioners, I literally, gave them this nice compendium. Also the forever facting. I mean, I just, I put it in their hands. I said, I know you're not gonna read this, but this is why many of us wanna see this industry held accountable. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's frustrating, uh, the, the evidence and the science and the common sense. And then we're sitting here wondering why people don't do more. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think you just answered a question that Karen had put in the uh, chat about even if we're unsure if our health impacts are from oil and gas, we should probably still report it. Or her question is, should we still report it? And I, I think your answer is yes. Right, Andrew, you could probably comment on what that form asks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, really quickly, I mean, the form itself, um, gives you a lot of leeway in terms of um, what health impacts you could be reporting. I mean, they even go into things um, such as anxiety and stress, which are impacts that can especially, you know, during a fracking phase when there's a lot of activity on the site. And if your home is across the street, so you're getting lights flashing in or the noise, I mean, that's a health impact that if you're you know, <laughs> feeling anxious because of increased industrial activity in your neighborhood. But so, I mean, I, the, 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 the instructions I've received from the CDPHE when I've discussed this form with them is that um, they would rather that people sort of err on the side of oversharing, I guess, um, depending on your comfort level. But I mean, the, the goal of this tool is for people to use it. 
and for people to use it in a way that will inform them of the potential impacts that may be occurring in proximity to certain sites. So um, I would, I mean, I always encourage people, even if there are doubts, I mean, this is environmental health and pollution 101. There's the causality can always be a little difficult for anyone to establish, which is how some of these industries get away with what they get away with. So um, when we have these tools available to us to at least uh, try to shine a light on what may be going on, I think we should take advantage of them as much as possible. And I'll just emphasize, Andrew did a great job uh, with my patient. I, I was fortunate to know some folks and um, he said, you know, my neighbors tell me they smell the same thing. So if, if you're near, a, and he was near storage tanks. And again, if you have two or three or four people making a, a complaint and it seems to coincide at a certain time because of venting or flaring or just poor maintenance, um, that's much more powerful. But um, that's what it's going to take. It's going to take all of us to say, um, we don't like what we're seeing. We need to hold it accountable, not with frivolous unsubstantiated, but my gosh, Mitzi, what, ex what happened to you was, uh, was absolutely an exposure, given the fact other folks were there as well. So um, use the tools that we have them. I was also, uh, CDPHE also, I know, is uh, using those complaints to decide where to send some of their mobile sampling equipment. So if they're getting a lot of complaints in an area, they're, they're more likely to send something there to find out what's going on. Um, I know that um, Broomfield actually, part of their program, they have inspectors that they can send onto the sites to see what's going on. I don't know if Longmont could do something like that. Um, yeah, uh, we, we have uh, Dr. Detlev's air monitoring pretty closely, pretty close by. So I think it, it picks up well, depending on the wind direction, right? Because it's a stationary, so maybe not as well as something on the on the fence line might. I have a question. Um, I, I've always wondered this. You know, when we get a uh, high ozone alert, they send out an I AQI index that says healthy, unhealthy for certain groups. And it has, you know, like at 50, I think it starts into certain levels red, yellow, green type of thing. Would it be possible to do that for any other VOCs or does the fact that um, benzene is never safe keep us from having that same level of um, sort of an alert to people stay inside today because the air pollution is bad? Uh, I don't know I don't think it's on, but it, unfortunately, uh, to my knowledge, there's very few, oh, there's that left. He can probably answer. I think the, the issue is, are we measuring it? And many places don't. Uh, there was a great question I thought um, Andrew posed, uh, again, Dr. McKenzie. Um, in your studies, are you coming up with similar or different conclusions than the CDPHE specifically concerning their study from 2019, recently released. Yeah, so that I did have, that was the Holder study that I had in uh, referenced. And I believe the conclusions between our risk assessment and the Holder study were actually quite similar. Hmm. Um, yeah. Where we have things that we can directly compare. And what's interesting about that is we use different methods. So we use direct measurements. Hmm. And they, they used uh, modeling from um, emission rates. Well, that's very compelling. <laughs> yeah. yeah, real quick, I can't remember where I was on, but I, I think there are folks trying to develop apps that could be on their phones, which would make it a lot easier uh, to make a report, to get capture data, GPS data, all that fun stuff. So uh, let's just encourage that and find those industries, uh, support folks like that love who are constantly doing this um, and expand. That to me is gonna show, I mean, Andrew with Earthworks is so powerful. We need about a hundred of you out just combing the place and then we'll, I mean, it's unconverted. Uh, it's just irrefutable, it's there. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're muted, Carol Karen. You're muted. Yeah. I got another message sent directly to me. I think it must be coming to my 
attention here. So the question was, can Detlev address the apparent ramp up to and continued high levels of toluene and particularly benzene at Union Reservoir since the night well commenced fracking on or about July 15th? Detlev, are you on and unmuted? I don't think Detlev can unmute himself. Okay. Um, I don't know if Lynette, are you on? Can you make uh, Detlev able to? Oops, you went back on. I can do it. Just a sec. Let me okay. get it. Thanks. He's unmuted right now, I think. Oh, he is? Mm -hmm. He's unmuted, oh, but yeah, I don't muted. know. Yeah, go ahead. Can you hear me? I'm not sure if my microphone. Yeah, yeah turn, your, turn your mic up a little bit. Uh, we can hold it. Okay, it. hold it up. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody. Yeah, I tried to say something earlier, but I was, was, was couldn't unmute myself. Because uh, so there was one question earlier about the air quality index. And it's really a, a, a funky metrics for um, gauging air quality. Um, the, the EPA has a procedure to determine the air quality index. And it's actually depending on, I think it's five different... Um, criteria pollutant, which is um, carbon monoxide, it's ozone, it's PM 2.5, it's actually SO2, um, and I think nitrogen oxides. So to do it properly, according to the EPA protocol, you need to measure all those and and you look at the actual uh, concentrations versus some 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 pollution thresholds that are being set. Um, and then you take the ratio, you add them all together. It's, it's super complicated. It's super complicated. Um, it cannot really be done in real time because these measurements are only done in very, very few places in the region. So because of that, you know, different groups, organizations use different approaches and the different subsets of, um, of these different variables that are being monitor monitored and then try to present an air quality index based on one or two or three of these pollutants. But just by looking at the air quality index, you don't know right away, does this now relate to particles or to ozone to, or to carbon monoxide? Um, there's really no um, one for VOCs that's, that's included in this. So the, the air quality indices you see do not consider VOCs typically. Um, I find it very confusing. There was just an article about it in one of the papers a few weeks ago um, that, that addressed that difficulty. And sometimes it's actually used on modeling and projections rather than actual data. Um, my recommendation is to look at the actual data. This is real, this is measured at that moment. And you can see exactly, you know, is this now for ozone or particles? Um, you know, we are providing now these measurements and including many of these species in real time. And you can see the, the levels as they were five minutes ago and you see where this was monitoring. So this is real, this is concrete, this is specific um, and it's not modeled. And you can see which, which variables are considered. And the, the most concerning ones here in the area where we are, are ozone and particles usually where we unfortunately over the past weeks and months have approached and exceeded um, health guideline values and, and thresholds very, very regularly. Um, so those are the ones I would recommend to pay the most attention to. Um, so that was the air quality index. Um, and then the second question um, was concerning um, particular VOCs um, at the Union Reservoir. And I just presented that at, to the um, Longmont City Council um, a couple of days ago. And, um, um, you know, we had, we've had episodes um, at the Union Reservoir where we've seen an abundance of occurrences with, with highly elevated levels of oil and gas VOCs. Um, there was a, a stretch of almost two months in 2020 and in, in February and March, where we observed that. And then we had a, a number of events earlier this year in January and February, where we had highly elevated levels um, of methane, of ethane, and, and also benzene. 
where some of these VOCs were, um, to the best of our estimate, several thousand times higher than the background, which clearly shows there were plumes um, with vented gas um, moving across the reservoir and across the station where we were taking these data. Um, the last two months or so, and I showed that in my presentation just a couple of days ago, um, it has been reasonably quiet. Um, it has been much quieter than what we saw earlier this year and what we saw last year. So we, we haven't really seen a clear evidence that the activities at that night well have transported um, plumes with elevated methane or VOCs across the monitoring station at the Union Reservoir. Um, of course, it doesn't mean that there haven't been releases or plumes. Um, we are, I would say, a mile to two miles away southwest of that site. You know, if the winds are from the south, we wouldn't um, encounter those plumes at the Union Reservoir. So as I said, we haven't seen them. It doesn't necessarily mean there haven't been any releases, but we're measuring 24 seven, the, you know, the, the air flow dribbles around most days. Um, you know, usually given we're measuring there all the time, it's likely we will capture it and see it sooner or later. But so far, I don't see anything clearly in the data that shows there's a, it's, it's a strong um, source, a new source that we haven't seen in the past um, originating from that well site. Thank you. Um, Mitzi sent me a message that says it's spiking right now. So, you know, you might have to, might have to take a look again. Um, some of us kind of follow that. Um, we're, we're pretty, uh, um, I know whenever I start wheezing, I look and I can always see that toluene and benzene are up. Um, did you have any other uh, things, Michael or Judith? Was that? Um, there, one uh, maybe quick answer would be uh, probably from Lisa, from Dr. McKenzie. Have there been any reviews comparing studies of health impacts between traditional vertical wells and the current fracking unconventional wells? There hasn't been a review of that that I know of. So it gets really difficult. So, so prior to kind of the boom in fracking, there weren't a lot of health studies around uh, residential areas and um, residential exposures to oil and gas with traditional oil and gas. Um, now that we have this un the development of the unconventional resources with our new modern methods, um, it's really hard to separate out the what's going on at the older traditional sites from our newer modern sites. They're all in there together. Mm -hmm. So um, that that makes it a really difficult to separate out those kinds of exposures. And, and oftentimes, you know, the um, hydraulic fracturing sites go right in on top of one of the old sites. Yeah. And I think another concern of mine is uh, is when the, the sites are quote finished fracked, even sitting dormant, uh, whether they're old or new, the uh, the concern yeah. of, of material continuing to come up through that portal is uh, high, and mm -hmm. uh, the industry is not going to really cap them correctly. Mm -hmm. So you know, there's I'll say there's you know the hazardous air pollutants are coming from different various sources on the well pad, but one of the sources is the petroleum resource itself. So oil and natural gas have impurities in them or they have hydrocarbons in them. And those include benzene, toluene, xylene, ethyl benzene. Those are all hexane. Those are all hazardous air pollutants on our hazardous air pollutant list. They're naturally occurring in petroleum products. So whether it's a traditional site or unconventional site, those pollutants are likely to be associated with the site. And I was thinking about the comment about old wells. Um, some of you might not have been um, interested in fracking when Tony and Graffia used to come and talk to us once in a while, but uh, 
he uh, says that all wells, the abandoned wells will eventually leak because they're plugged with concrete, right? And so there's just so many places that they can, um, can begin to leak. And it's very hard to stop gas from leaking. It's hard enough to stop water from leaking, right? If you have, you know, a shower or something that has a leak, it's hard to stop a drip. And if it's a gas, it's even harder. And so concrete as it ages and cracks um, will leak. So we have uh, over 100,000 holes in our in the ground in our state that uh, can potentially leak. Okay. Were there any other questions, Michael or Judith? I don't believe so. I think that's it. All right. Well, I want to thank um, thank my committee members again. So thank you for being here, and uh, thank you to our to our speakers, Andrew and and Dr. McKenzie and Dr. Carroll, and thank you, Dr. Detlev, for for um, piping in and a reminder that uh, you'll be receiving information about our next um, um, uh, uh, part, part three of this webinar series on um, sort of some of the things that we're trying to do to uh, keep, keep our land, air, and water a little cleaner and help our Mother Earth. So thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Mm -hmm.